Hegreev Khetan, managing partner, and incidentally, the Khetan and Khetan and Company grew a small regional law firm into one of the largest in the country in a little over a decade. His driving purpose is to build a lasting brand. Just about two weeks back, the over a century old firm became the first Indian law firm to cross 150 partner mark. It recently announced its partner promotions, after which it has 153 partners and 670 lawyers across its four locations. As many as 95 of the partners are equity partners, while 58 are salaried. It also has about 20 councils. In the final dispatch for the series Future of Deal Making, we get into a freewheeling discussion with Hegreev Khetan on aspects such as the sentiment of India Inc., the evolution of India's antitrust regime, and finally, as an industry leader, what he thinks is the future of the legal industry. Mr. Khetan, it's my sheer pleasure and privilege to be hosting you. And what a beautiful closure to the series of very meaningful conversations that we have been having under the ages of future of deal making in partnership with Khetan and Company. Let me first ask you, how are you feeling today? Oh, feeling very good. Uh, very glad to be here. Thank you very much uh, for this great opportunity, Shrija. And uh, feeling good, notwithstanding, you know, all of the <laughs> lockdown and pandemic. But uh, yes, doing all right. You know, what do you think is the sentiment of India Inc. right now? You know, the front end of lockdown really saw it being in a very foggy kind of sentiment from India Inc. It was more confused. Do you think sanity is coming in right now? And what is the sense that you get in talking with corporates and heads of India Inc? So, you know, this came as a really, really uh, big uh, shock to corporate India. And uh, nobody ever could have imagined uh, that uh, what a havoc this could have created uh, to society generally, you know, and to people. And that obviously had, a, had an effect on business. And uh, corporate India uh, was uh, sort of sitting back and just thinking uh, what is really going to happen and uh, what are the going to be the effects of this uh, on business. And I think what has really happened uh, with a little bit of passage of time, uh, April, May, June, now one quarter is over. And I think I see corporate India emerge very, very strong and very determined, uh, so very strong and determined to fight through this. And uh, they know for now there is a sort of recognition that the vaccine is far away. Uh, so if the vaccine is far away, we have to act, we have to do whatever it takes uh, to not uh, lose what corporate India has built over, let's say, you know, since independence really, or even pre-independence. I think these are very interesting two words that you mentioned that India Inc. is strong and determined. Now, sort of, I want to understand from you that brings my next question that, you know, increasingly the conversation in India Inc. is moving towards data. Perhaps that is being labeled as the new oil or perhaps more important than oil. Now, I want to understand from you that the data economy demands a certain new set of regulation or sort of new set of guidance. You know, as one of the keen observers of India Inc. and the captains of the legal industry, what would be your advice if you were to step back and think about this entire data framework building out in India? Uh, so actually, you know, you're absolutely right. The new oil is data. And uh, more so in the COVID environment, uh, what everybody has learned is uh, that, look, uh, you can sit at home and work, but what would you do? Uh, without, you know, the digital tools and without data. So, uh, yes, you need, of course, the digital tools. So, yes, hardware, software, but you have to work with data. Uh, so, I think that recognition has come. Now, how are we dealing with it uh, from a legal landscape? Uh, so, we were in an environment where look, we didn't need any laws and rules around uh, data. Uh, 
So it was a laissez-faire environment, do what you like. Uh, and that really moved, uh, as we saw Western, uh, you know, uh, sort of businesses and governments uh, start legislating around the use of data. And we were not far behind. So we had our own IT Act, we had our own data privacy rules. Uh, but uh, I think now what we are really moving towards is a new set of rules and regulations uh, around data privacy, around storage, around the use of data, uh, some of the ethical uh, issues around data. Uh, and I think that the only advice I would give both to the regulator uh, and uh, let's say the regulated uh, would be there must be a fair balance because uh, if we make the mistake of over-regulation uh, around data, you know, then we will really be, uh, you know, sort of killing this even before it's truly uh, born and grown up, you know. So I think that's really would be very unfortunate. So good balance is needed. That's beautifully put that, you know, it has to be a fair balance between the regulator and the regulated. Now that really segues into my next question, this entire reg tech conundrum. You know, do you think that, you know, regulation also needs to evolve as fast as the pace of technology? Because technology, I mean, really is, you know, evolving at a great, at a very, very fast speed as we speak. In fact, there are companies more and more talking about digital transformation, of course, being accelerated by the pandemic. Are there countries which are very evolved set of laws, you know, as rec tech is keeping pace with technology? One would wonder what is your sort of viewer advice there? No, completely. I mean, let's take, uh, for example, uh, one small example of the number of changes happening to our laws today. Now, if we really didn't have technology uh, to support all of those changes, uh, there's just no way by which we could keep up to speed with all of those changes. Uh, at the same time, when we talk about rec tech, uh, we also need to sort of have simpler and lesser number of laws. So if we are really going to have, let's say, compliances, tech can help us in compliances. So in India, there was some survey and they said there are more than 66,000 compliances uh, a corporate has to do, or uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, corporate plus individual uh, has to do. Now tech can help you meet those compliances, but there are limitations. So when we say reg and when we say tech, uh, we have to have, again, uh, yes, regulations, but we have to have practical regulations. We have to have lesser number of regulations. Obviously, we need regulatory environment and we need regulations. And the technology can help us in two ways. They can obviously help complying because, you know, the technical tools and the technology will be there. Uh, but at the same time, we can't curtail technology through regulation where that potential is lost, I should say. So it is, um, I think we've seen from uh, foreign governments, we've seen uh, in India that uh, again, uh, this uh, marrying of reg and tech is important, uh, but again, we need a very, very fine balance. So. The marrying of reg and tech, as fairly as you put it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, Mr. Khidan, I think uh, I think you were sort of always saying this word very beautifully, you know, the fine balance. And it's a very important sort of statement. And what we are seeing right now in the country, and uh, it's a very overpowering narrative of, you know, protectionism and nationalism, especially the lines between them are increasingly blurring. And coming in the wake of the pandemic, the interconnectedness of supply chain between nations is now getting under scrutiny more and more. Of course, one is referring to China and what really is happening on the border is increasingly becoming the euphemism of what we are seeing in laws also. You yeah. know, perhaps, you know, it's, you know, emanating from that region. You know, I want to understand from you that what does it mean for India Inc. in terms of deal making, especially at a time when nationalism and protectionism are being talked in the same breath? Um, you know, we can really see that uh, most countries uh, are going towards a nationalist and protectionist environment. And when we talk about, you know, globalization, 
um, uh, most countries have gone away uh, from that to nationalism and protection. However, let's look at COVID itself. How countries have collaborated uh, in fighting this virus, how countries are collaborating in terms of development of a vaccine. And uh, you can see across uh, you know, uh, oceans and borders, uh, countries are collaborating. Countries are collaborating that if and when a vaccine is developed, uh, where will be production bases? How will we create uh, you know, quantity which we need to supply? So I think um, while uh, you know, uh, we, all the countries really need to uh, be nationalist uh, today, they need to protect, uh, but I don't think they can do without globalization. Uh, when we look, you know, your question about India, I really compliment uh, our Prime Minister on the Atmanir Bharat scheme and the fact that, look, uh, we need to be self-sufficient, we need to have our own resources, uh, we need to set up manufacturing in the country, uh, all of that accepted. But having said that, can we do without collaboration across the world? So whether it is technology, whether it is life sciences, whether it is capital, I think we need each other. So that collaborative environment around globalization has to be there. And I see that happening. It's not that it is not happening. And countries who don't actually adopt that, I think those countries won't uh, further themselves. And in India, I think uh, the government has taken a very pragmatic view, I should say. But on the one hand, look, we need to be self-sufficient. On the other hand, uh, they've opened the doors for capital. They've opened the doors uh, for technology. Uh, capital can freely come in. Capital can go out. Uh, you know, we've seen what... Uh, you know, Reliance and Geo have done, they've shown the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we, are, we are welcoming foreign investors, we are welcoming foreign partners. So I think, uh, you know, uh, that's what India needs. And I think India has a great opportunity today uh, in this whole geopolitical environment to really take advantage of this situation and uh, offer India as a base uh, for manufacturing. So I think that's a huge opportunity. So, but do you think that there's sort of increasing concern coming that, uh, you know, is perhaps India developing its own firewall like China did, especially in terms of technology? And while on one hand, it is a great case for Indian startup ecosystem or Indian entrepreneurs to go out and build their own technology, there's also increasing commentary coming in that, you know, competition should be on fair grounds and fair groups. Oh, I, I wonder sort of, uh, you know, what is your sense there? I think the Indian entrepreneur is far more astute than we think. And uh, both uh, the government and the Indian entrepreneur, uh, you know, beyond a certain point, uh, you know, you can't legislate. And uh, we all as Indians know uh, what is good for us and how to protect our interests. So... Uh, you know, in our own interest, in, in order to protect our own value, we will build our firewalls. We don't need over-regulation to build this firewall. And uh, if you see giants across the world, uh, whether in tech or otherwise, uh, they have built their firewalls irrespective of government. Uh, so let, let, let's look at a Samsung or an Apple. They have their own firewalls. They have their own protection of IP and technology. So I'd say that, look, uh, leave a little bit to the Indian entrepreneur uh, rather than legislating everything. And I think we will find a good way. Talking about tech, and that really is the mainstay you know, in almost every conversation right now. You know, what we are seeing is that in this large consumer internet economy, if you look at any niche or space there, it is perhaps being characterized by duopolies or monopolies. Do you think it perhaps the time is right to have a more robust set of antitrust policies? And perhaps where are we lacking there in that direction? What do you think? No, I'd say that, look, um, again here, uh, it would be wrong to uh, say that, look, this duopoly or these limited number of players uh, should be investigated or broken up. We have come this far 
uh, only because of let's say the research development and the capabilities brought by these giants now if you have uh, all of these giants uh, sort of uh, broken up uh, then would that strength of development remain is one side of the question on the other hand uh, obviously there needs to be some check and balance so whether it is around data usage whether it is around uh, security uh, whether it is around national security or it's around personal data uh, there needs to be some regulatory uh, reach but uh, uh, you know again on the anti trust and competition side uh, whether or not uh, you know uh, uh, this power is being abused obviously it needs to be under check and uh, or, you know we for example know of cases uh, where uh, you know um, this famous app store uh, issue has been challenged and whether or not that is anti competitive so these have to evolve over a period of time i'm not saying we don't need regulations we don't need uh, our anti trust regulator to look at this obviously we do but uh, i would really worry that uh, uh, you know if there is an overreach uh, i think the the development shouldn't stop because this is the new age and uh, you know so so i th i think uh, it's a difficult question to answer because <laughs> nobody knows you know which way it will go uh, and, and let competition uh, you know there are so many new players coming up and i wouldn't uh, discount the startups i wouldn't discount them that look uh, the big are so big uh, that uh, the startups can't actually come in and penetrate so i mean look at the new players today uh, yeah. uh, there's so many new players how many of us you know 5 years ago were hooked on to netflix how many of us you know uh That's interesting point you know and i think i also there's a larger point also drawn in the indian context for instance uh you know look at the e-commerce space if you have an amazon you also have a walmart or flipkart if you have the online taxi space you have the global major incumbent uber then you have homegrown ola so you yeah. know it trust their place perhaps a much larger important role also i feel yeah and if you look at uh, food delivery you look at uh, delivery you look at transportation uh, you have so many players and uh, you look at retail you look at uh, niche retail so i think it is uh, it's a mistake to really say okay there is one big uh, player and uh, look uh, that player should be broken up or that player uh, is anti competitive i think there is room for so many so many to actually grow and flourish uh so i think it it is really it will be wrong to just make a comment that big is bad uh i'd say small is beautiful and <laughs> <laughs> that's a beautiful saying you know small is beautiful and big is bad uh you know <laughs> that that's such an interesting uh, you know kind of comment that you made right now also this entire conversation about uh, you know insolvency also becomes very important of course the ibc laws have been suspended i know that this is a subject which you really have huge expertise in and we have spoken about this also in the past i want to really sort of pick up your brains on this today you know where do you think uh, mr ketan how will this ibc where does it go from here how will this transformational piece of law evolve and i was in conversation with uh, you know mr sidul shop also a few days back and he sort of alluded to the point that uh, because this has been dropped there's a chance that a lot of companies and promoters will also misuse this i want to perhaps pick up your brains and what do you think about this i guess uh, you know this was a good move to put some moratorium uh, because uh, you know uh, otherwise there would be really anarchy if banks did not uh, act and take companies into insolvency they wouldn't be fulfilling their duty on the other hand there was really no time uh, for businesses and companies to even think uh, that look how to restructure how to refinance so i think it was a very very good move uh, that some breathing space was needed to take now having got this breathing space uh, i guess uh, there is time on both sides to calibrate look where do we stand and what is it that we need to do 
where I think more than continuing with this moratorium, uh, I think uh, our regulator and the Reserve Bank need to come up with restructuring package guidelines where businesses and banks, uh, there is a framework under which you can restructure. And uh, if that guideline is well made, uh, transparent, and uh, it's uh, not misused, then I think it will work well. So a good breathing space is being given, opportunity to survive, and then a package to restructure. That will be the best way to do it, according to me. Yeah, that's, I think, very meaningful. Also, I wanted to understand from you, we spoke about quite a few things, spoke about antitrust, protectionism, insolvency in bankruptcy, tech talk. But you are also somebody who is so, you know, meaningful in terms of the legal ecosystem that we have in this country, being part of one of the oldest law firms in the country. If you were to sort of touch on the evolution of legal practice in India, you know, where do we go from here? What are the key opportunities or key challenges that you see? Or perhaps how your own business is being disrupted, the future of legal industry, what would that really be? I'd say the future is around digital and collaboration. And uh, uh, look at today, uh, we are about 750 lawyers and each one of us connected digitally, uh, working from home. Uh, very few of us really need to go to the office uh, to get anything. All our records are available on the cloud. Uh, all the clients are connected uh, through the internet. So I think that, look, we've all learned uh, that, look, how important digitization is. Uh, courts have adapted so fast uh, to actually conduct digital hearings and have a roster, uh, have a very good system for listing of matters and uh, uh, counsel and lawyers from across the world are appearing in Indian courts. So irrespective of which city you are. So I think one big um, opportunity for the Indian legal community is uh, moving towards the digital sort of economy and digital services. Uh, that I think is a huge opportunity. And I think the other opportunity is collaborative working. Uh, again, uh, what this uh, lockdown and, and uh, COVID has shown us that if your expert is, let's say in Kerala or in West Bengal, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're all together in one place and you could be offering services to somebody in Delhi with your practitioner in Kerala uh, or your practitioner sitting in Lucknow. It just doesn't matter. And it's really that expertise where you can collaborate very well. So I think for, for the lawyer uh, today, huge opportunity and uh, the sort of barrier that you have to be uh, in these two big cities, Mumbai or Delhi to do well has gone. Uh, and I think that's a huge opportunity for Indians. Uh, if I can live in uh, Bhopal or Indore or Rajkot and uh, actually do uh, top tier legal work, irrespective of where I am, uh, that's the best of uh, all worlds. So I think a uh, huge opportunity. I also want to understand from you that you achieved a very significant milestone recently where you went beyond the 150 partner mark. You know, the first time the first legal law firms in India to do this. What does that really mean for the evolution of corporate law firms in India and the entire ecosystem? Uh, look, for, uh, for us, what it really means and shows is uh, the journey towards institutionalizing the firm. And uh, from a firm which uh, was uh, not very long ago, a very small firm uh, based in Calcutta, uh, to a national firm and uh, with the largest sort of uh, partners, number of partners uh, in an Indian law firm. And uh, to that extent, I'd say that, look, we are truly uh, an in institutional professional uh, practice. And it just shows that, look, on the one side, uh, there is really very good demand for quality legal services. And on the other hand, if you really have very good systems, processes, uh, you know, you can all come together collectively and uh, build a good professional services firm. Uh, so I think, again, uh, 
a very good time for uh, the youngster, I should say. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I know for, for example, uh, young lawyers who are appearing in very large matters against uh, some of the stalwarts and senior counsel in the Supreme Court. Uh, but that's what the opportunity is today, that uh, technology and uh, digitization uh, offers you that, which uh, it never offered you before. And that's the opportunity, I'd say, today uh, for, for lawyers in our firm and others. Uh, I think other firms are also doing exceedingly well, and they've adapted to the times exceedingly looks like that the wave of disruption is all pervasive across all aspects of life. <laughs> you know, given that you are such a close observer of deal making, I want to sort of spend some next five to 10 minutes from you because the topic is the future of deal making. You know, the Reliance transaction, the geo transaction, you know, partnering with Google and Facebook. I want to understand from you that how do you think this transaction will go down in history? Uh, this is history in every way. This is history uh, for, uh, let's say, for, a com for an Indian company to attract uh, the best companies across the world in terms of technology, capital, uh, to put money and their confidence uh, behind what is being created in India. So this is not just Indian history, but world history. Uh, I think the largest ever capital raise uh, by an Indian company. Uh, then I'd say to do it all digitally during the COVID times, uh, I'd say really compliments to uh, Reliance and uh, it's a matter of pride for the country, I'd say. Uh, so definitely uh, this is a, a very, very historic moment for the country. And three concerns, if you were to give me, you know, playing out in the minds of institutional investors when they think about deal making, what would that really be? Um, I, I, the first one I would say is regulatory certainty. So the institutional investor uh, is uh, looking at India uh, where they see huge opportunities. The opportunities in terms of consumption, demand, as a base for the world, uh, as very good talent. Uh, in every way, I think they look at India very positively. A rule of law, an independent judiciary. So I think they have all of that. What I think they uh, need to know and get the confidence is regulatory certainty. And uh, what they do want is, look, whether it's a small environmental rule or a land route, uh, you know, regulation, uh, or a tax change, uh, small changes have large effects on uh, investor confidence. And I think regulatory certainty uh, is something which is on everybody's mind. I can, I can tell you that. That is the big sort of elephant in the room, if I may say. And partly it may be perception and partly it may be reality. But uh, uh, we in India need to work at it uh, to give uh, confidence to the foreign investor. And what do you think, you know, how will 2020 be really in terms of deal making? Of course, the geo transaction has been an outlier, but sort of barring that, what do you think the general sentiment will be? Because from our conversations in this series, future of deal making, the big takeaway really has been that perhaps private equity will take charge. What do you think? Uh, I'd say that deal making will be very busy uh, for 2020. Why will it be busy? Because, you know, in any uncertain time, uh, you know, uh, companies and businesses hedge. So there will be companies which will hedge uh, and say, okay, let me divest a business and raise capital rather than borrow more. So that will lead to more m and transactions. There will be businesses in distress, which will be compelled to do transactions. And uh, then there will be a lot of consolidation. So again, what we've seen is a change in mindset where competitors or players are willing to come together and really create that institutional value. So I think that uh, will really mean very busy times for deal making. Uh, the financial sponsor of private equity will play a, a pivotal role uh, in deal making. You know, I think uh, capital in India 
and capital from banks and institutions in India will not be sufficient. Uh, and uh, whether in terms of capital to survive or capital for growth. And uh, it'll be really where we will have to reach out to private equity uh, and financial sponsors. And it's an opportunity for them. So I think they will play a major role uh, in deal making. And now it's time for my rapid fire. My first question to you, the first thing that came into your mind when you heard about the geo transaction, the first reaction. Oh, I was in awe. Absolutely. The biggest high point for Khetan and company for 2020. Uh, well, I should say for 2020, really being uh, uh, working for Reliance on some of their uh, capital raises. And the 150 partner mark for Ketan and company? Uh, well, I, I'll put it this way that that's a result. I don't think <laughs> we were really... <laughs> it's still a very small firm, I would say, uh, from where we can be. One deal which you think would have advised on in your career? Uh, well, uh, you see, the deals which uh, you do very early in the stage in your career uh, stick to your heart. So I'd say that uh, CESC's uh, international capital raise and then restructuring is really very close to my heart because uh, that was the first large deal I worked on and uh, look however large uh, and complex deals might get but you know you can't forget your first <laughs> that is so true you know one big challenge for the legal industry or perhaps what keeps Hagrib Khetan awake at night <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, look, uh, uh, the ability to sort of expand uh, beyond uh, India uh, is uh, something which uh, I, it, it keeps making me think. And I think that's a great opportunity. And the way Indian businesses have been able to go abroad, I wish uh, Indian firms could also have the ability to do that. Okay. And if you were to give one advice to the FM of the country, a two-minute pitch, or perhaps when you find yourself stuck with an, in an elevator with her, what would that show you? Oh, when I come to you know the practice of law and law firms, uh, I would really say that look, allow Indian law firms to raise third-party capital, and uh, I would really tell her that look, like many other sectors like defence. Uh, or you know have controls where maybe 51% have to be you know owned by advocates, Indian advocates. Uh, there is uh, you know data security, uh, but allow third capital, third party capital raising. That's very well put. That's actually the that's a very sort of beautiful answer which I have not heard from a lot of people. <laughs> the one advice you would like to give to your private equity friends and colleagues: Do you think the future of deal making is perhaps more virtual and over Zoom calls, and they need to develop that skill quite a bit? I think they have all of the skills. Just I, my advice would be, uh, you know, they, they don't uh, they don't need more of that. I think the advice would be just go on and make deals and do more and more deals. If you were to advise SoftBank on its next step, what would that be? Oh, well, I think they're a great, great company, great investor. And look, my advice uh, would really be that, look, uh, you know, there are ups and downs uh, in investments and that's part of it. Uh, and, and I'm sure they know and they're not going to uh, sort of uh, get delusioned by one or two investments, uh, maybe because of the times. Uh, looking at lower values. So I, my advice would be just keep going. Okay, my last question to you, Mr. Khetan. A lot of, you know, young law professionals sort of look up to you. And when you're as a leader, you know, for this industry, if you were to do a communique or conversation with them, a leadership mantra, what would that be? Uh, well, my mantra is, uh, you know, wear blinkers like in a horse race. When you join this profession, and uh, just run the race with blinkers. Don't look left and right. And uh, if you really want to win. Thank you, Mr. Ketan. Thank you so much for sort of joining us for this lovely conversation. It is quite sad that, you know, we are coming to the end of this entire series of this beautiful conversation called Future of Dealmaking in partnership with Ketan and Company. But at the time we see you next, goodbye and good luck and do stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you. Very much enjoyed doing it and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.